Hello, hello, hello. Um, our next reader is another brilliant young lad who I think of as a son. We have a few, we have a big family. Um, he is about to release his third collection of poetry, which is Chimney Sweeps and Prophets. The first one uh, was for real, this, no, it was, was Le Jeune Halls, Life's Le Jeune Halls. Second was for Bill de Siderata. And uh, they're amazing reads. I highly recommend them. But without further ado, Christopher P. Gazette. Hmm? Take your mask off. Take your mask off and show the people who you is. Off. Thank you, Hazen. Take that horrible thing off from around your neck. Let your spirit run free. Ah, uh, with the untethered face. <laughs> Unt! No, no, move your cheek this way for the camera, please. Thank you, sir. And you can see yourself so you can frame yourself accordingly. Just making sure you are on. You are on. Yeah. <clears throat> My two eternal muses are uh, nature and baseball. Can't have one without the other. No. And uh, this uh, poem was inspired by the latter. And, uh, the holy thing has turned out all right. This is called The Bitter End. Perfection reigned for centuries, embodied in the petals of the lilies in summer, emblazoned on the coats of the pedestrians in winter, erupting from the mouths of the birds in spring, inscribed in the lines on the leaves in autumn. The little men and women baked peasant bread, and everyone ate it and said it was good. The troubadours blasted their horns, and the coopers steamed their casks, and people sang hymns to the sun. Then the dragons came with their fire and lightning, and the duchies all suffocated in the dust and debris. For all my life I had believed that heroes would defeat villains, and God was good, and water could extinguish the flames of chaos. Instead, the streak has come to an end. Light filters through the ash to reach the rubble to which the city has been reduced. And I wander the abandoned alleys, turning corners of damaged buildings, bricks toppling as a sickened wind pushes through, the last newspaper shuffling in tatters along the pavement. Now I muse on this muted apocalypse. As my breath returns to normal, I silently acknowledge that we must accept a new order, one in which postcards may no longer be delivered, and friends may never again see one another. But we can smile at a dandelion bravely pushing itself up through the concrete to confront a world without meaning and bid it good morning, as if to say, what gravity can possibly be ascribed to hell when this heavenly day is all I have ever known? Sure. The unreliability of psychic telephony. Your image floats in and out of my mind like a telephone unanswered, words never spoken drifting in between reality and imagination. Somewhere on the other end of the line lies a loose happiness, but the operator cannot connect me for fear that this spark will ignite a fire and the world will burn from pole to pole. Hiding behind pseudonyms, businessmen and artists traverse the city. Shall you return like a bird to the nest? You are so close and so far away, and the messages I have left and your mystic answering machine have all turned to dust. I am screening the call of love to ensure that there is a voice coming through. Otherwise, my life will be filled with nothing but silence until I lie eternally silent in an austere cemetery, passers-by holding their breath as they walk above. The Antiseptic Properties of Tears. One, 
I stood atop the grandest mountain, and what a view there would have been if only there had been light to see by. Clutching the breast of Mother Earth, entreating for mercy, I wait in the hallowed halls of learning for the shadow puppet of a snake to creep around the corner. Nothing looks the same as in the movies, and the images are all distorted. There are some puzzles that have no solution. As much as the tortured mind tries to wrap itself around the numbers and logic, the answer will remain always elusive. 2. Let love carry you away. Let the blood-stained river flood your doorstep. Let the search for contact take you to the base of the pyramid, where every note of every chord cries out for a helping hand. There's nothing to lose but life itself, and life is lost already every time an empty house makes itself a soundboard for a soul's yearning, every time the candle blows out in the merciless wind of the north. 3. Awakening from oblivion, having slept the years away, I find myself inventing new vocabularies to describe these suburbs coated in glaciers. Every certainty crumbles into lint, and no one knows for sure which stories the rain will bring from tomorrow's clouds. True darkness is not a lack of, lack of light, but a lack of love. The blank sky challenges us to find meaning, to insert syllables into the poem which we are all writing together. All we can count on for certain is the disintegration of the steel beams that have held up this gray city and shepherded it into the new age, as it is written by the historians of the Fen. The Chamber, or The Anatomy of Sickness. 1. Ingress. Workers and flaneurs are shepherded into trains whose destinations are most sinister. Infectious air threatens to destroy the laborers who built the railways so that supreme horrors could travel across oceans and continents and shape faces who tried so hard to smile into screams. The chamber holds songs that we discovered before they existed, books that the ancients thumbed before they burned up, then magically reappeared to reveal their secrets to us. What a firestorm must erupt there into the slaughterhouse go the cows. If we wish to avoid a similar fate, we must evade the rapier that thrusts towards our breast and plot a means of surviving this terrible place. 2. The Dance of the Quill The pen must go on. Even when the streets are empty of humans, when food becomes luxury for the masses, the times must be documented for a tentative future with the plaint of hope that the people will crawl out of the sewers and learn of their hibernal heritage. Frenzy to be keepers of memories spill out ink. As the clock threatens to strike twelve. If this is a kind of mania, then let insanity reign over the duchies and fiefdoms until such time as order can tentatively be restored. The entire story will be recorded and published in newspapers and magazines to be read by future generations, tears dripping from their eyes as they realize the enormity of the cataclysm that still radiates through the air. 3. Skeletons and Pianos I wonder how many of the skeletons whose voices cry out in the depths of the permanent night will make it past their own knives that they clutch like the last loaf of bread that might sustain themselves. They mistake freckles for hematophages, ticks invading the atmosphere after bizarre weather has bridged the gap between fall of leaf and renewal of grass. This evening is most dreary, raindrops not giving a damn who might be passing between tiny cellars filled to the brim with pianos. The closet remains locked, and we can only imagine its unfortunate contents. This anatomy of sickness is astutely recorded by journalists who carry slim notebooks as they delve headlong into the fire that burns up facts like tinder. 4. Days dark as night. The most hilarious jokes never have the chance to be laughed at, sound muted, and television screen hopelessly pixelated. I am somehow starving off hellish intimations with the music of an erstwhile Satan. I take as my strange guests sine and cosine waves, perform a dance macabre with the figures undulating in my brain. 
The sun disappears behind a cloud like an animal being mauled by an animal. I hide in a cafe where my friends appear as in a dream, but this time it's finally, at last, real. Can a kiss be real if it does not happen, so long it is, as it is felt most viscerally? The moon mocks the peasants whose crops have dried up as the sun has left a holiday for Iceland. Sweden shines a flashlight on her populace, but they take care to hurry from house to house, from brothel to harem, not sure what to believe. Five, egress. The emergency exit is hidden behind walls and flags of red and yellow, duty mutilated into Sisyphean toil. The music playing on the loudspeaker is unlistenable, making me inauthentic in the eyes of the Rexes. No matter anymore who survive and who, panicking, pushing and shoving, drown in the crashed airplane. The chamber does not release pris its prisoners without a fight. One must sneak through the clan's hideout and discover the force that protects evil. Only after victory in the supreme battle will the boss of the underworld relent his grip on the earth and finally allow its citizens freedom. Strange, though, his freedom. Only perceptible after one has been a slave for a thousand years. And for that time, a slave have I been. The Ritual of Coffee. <laughs> the wisdom of all ages is found in the brown elixir protracted through the morning, broadcasting alien radio signals from the mouths of ordinary birds and roosters. This ritual betrays boyhood and aptitude, splitting wood with axes, but never really understanding the responsibilities of a grown man. Nonetheless, nymphic energy flows from his body, defying gender in the name of beauty. Yes, I could be an Aschenbach were I older, forbidden love killing me, cholera transformed into coronavirus. I stir like carafts brewing the potion, caffeine imbuing the heart with a kind of chemical love. Thunder guffaws at the tragedy of a youth destroyed by saltpeter of the mind and body, transformed into the oldest and ugliest of men, writing down these details in a commonplace book. Can I pretend you are gazing at me? I sip the coffee. May the day yet reveal beauties that even a widower of beauty can enjoy. This poem is for my 15-month-old nephew. A strange time to be born for Edward. The man inside the office has an essence locked inside a box that can never open. The blood is full of drugs, but someday the whip will come down. I do not know where stray cats go in the winter, nor do I know where stray humans go after death. The calendar runs wild in dreams, years flying by without courtesy of life. I was once a prince. You must succeed me in the house of magic. Once the fog has lifted from the world, where you will do great things. The ants venture out of their adopted houses, no longer afraid of the poisonous air. Clouds of thought watch over the earth, guardians of the meadows and fens. The body grows old, but the mind rejoices to see the children of a new era populating the world without fear. Then the denizens of the caves may cleanse themselves with water that delivers a merciful massacre. Just going to read one more poem. Well, maybe two. This is a long one. House. One from the heavens. The sky wanders barefoot into its cabinet. Stars dance primal and sexual ballets. Angels clumsily make their way through corridors that lead to contraband banquets. From here shall a boy be born, features and disposition inherited from anger and strife and love. Not by stork nor original canal is he delivered, but by the wonders of surgical magic, handed over to his father who cradles him like a robin's egg, tiny and precious and beautiful. 
but with all the fragility of a snowflake. Indeed, he flutters down from the heavens, seeing all the buildings and the ant cars and people, until he drops on the cold ground, melting like a candle dying in its holder. Then, shepherded by loving arms, he regains form in the house, where a precarious beginning must take place. 2. The Procession of Clocks Pieces of mail never to be opened arrive at the address of the suburban home. All seems to be silent, except for the sound of the timepiece sending a tick-tock pounding into his brain. It won't relent. His lifetime must span theological epics, because as the world flies by before his eyes, he mysteriously remains a child. The song of the rain patters on the roof, while the relentless rotation of the earth finally comes to a halt. The house remains standing for now. 3. Sorrow and Love The fission of the nucleus does not lead to ultimate power, but rather brackish tears and slammed doors as a house divides into two. He discovers anguish and devotion far earlier than Yahweh had ever intended. The grief and misery of senescent separation, the affection and yearning of youthful infatuation. The two grand muses stand clad in garlands, cawthorns and crowns of cypress. The object of desire is just a mime trapped in its own little world and never to be reached or touched. And so he walks down roads that lead nowhere, lampposts repeating themselves ad infinitum and shining on pavement that will never come to a halt. For a dark night. To unlock the black box is a rite of passage, turning the rusty key and heaving open the door. The room is as black as its container. Magazines have foreshadowed a coming together for those who are aligned with darkness, for those who have discovered the secret direction and the ancient compass rose. And now it is time. He casually falls into a vodka and Kahlua night with other birds who would or could not follow their flock in migration as they flew together to a new continent. He can now enter the door of any house, knowing the encyclopedia of code words that will allow access. Five income feathers. On his face and down his back, he possesses a poet's semaphore, a physical shibboleth from the land of words, a peculiar language that few can truly understand. A letter can save a life debased when the world is covered in lava, precariously leaning like the Tower of Pisa. So he sends letters to every human on the globe in the hope that they may be spared from the stick of dynamite his fuse threatens to ignite any second. To write is to bleed, and his blood hemorrhages through the house, filling sinks and bathtubs, standing walls and ceilings, Truly, his words must change the world five lonely seconds at a time. Six machinations. The best laid travel plans see humans taking airplanes into the inferno, musculature disintegrating with the heat. To survive the day is implausible, while the injustices of the world emaciate this house until it collapses of frailty, invisible torture leaving no physical marks. In the upstairs room, he counts his pennies, beard unshaven and scraggly. Mother and father are now foreign concepts. How shabby he has become, clothing all worn out, shoes falling apart with no cobbler to repair them. The story is near its end, and he's ready for the book to turn back to its very first page, but this time with completely new words. Seven, Into the Heavens. After all the checks are signed, and all the money transferred, after the sick are comforted and the dead buried, his soul transmigrates, flying away like a dream from her brain. Who can remember life when it is so far in the past? The new realm is so beautiful, clouds becoming pillows for the freed soul that no longer toils in the mines. His spirit dances far above the skylight, but if you look very, very hard, you can make out a faint glow over the rainbow. Then you will detect the crumbs of being falling from the tray of existence somewhere within this great 
celestial house that we dare to call our home. This will be my last poem. <clears throat> Something about rabbits and hats. One, meditations on the tile purgatory illuminated by garish yellow. There is a terrible room where you cannot tell azure from anguish. Sensation is so fleeting, the pleasures of blurry consciousness and forgotten state seeming to dim her terror. Words must ambulate. They cannot sit pretty on the coffee table. Entire locomotives rumble down the track, switching gauges between countries, passengers waiting for numbers to turn over and destroy themselves, for riddles not to be solved, but to self-destruct. Names are absolutely useless. Once the mouth is finally satisfied, ejecting these meaningless syllables, the heart will rest upon the bed of hay, and its body will relax, and breath become steady before dying out. An objection to abjection, starbursts and pyrotechnics test the faith of sheep in the manger who know nothing of devils and gods. I will honor my forgotten brothers by growing my bared person. To opine without the horror of commentary, to create without the embarrassment of criticism, is impossible and impermissible. A facade of satisfaction is worth but pence when there are cars in the ditches and the sirens are blaring, desperately trying to alert the people that this storm may never pass. Luckily, there is the verbal cellar that will always provide a measure of sanctuary. Letters bound together to keep out the rain and shelter us from those whose statues can never be erected. Two. Monsoon winds in the microclimate of Black Bear Land. Language must be extracted from the mine shaft of time. Animals must be recovered from beneath the suture. The entire history of medicine proving to be nothing more than the work of charlatans. The blank canvas of day after day, with no colors for any paintbrushes available, will shred to pieces under the unforgiving light of the sun. The lesser demigods make the decisions whether text ought to be bundled into scrolls or typed out on the most modern of typewriters. Rodents gnaw at the summer wire, electrical insulation gone that had protected us from autumn. The animals had all been in hiding, refugees from the cartel of winter, but now they come out into the sunlight, observing how the trees have metamorphosed. The seasons spin like a roulette wheel or a car tire. Comedians tell the news of the world in pantomime and slapstick, but nobody laughs. The garden of innocence is decimated, weeds encroaching on dying flowers, petals devoured by deer. If you can reach very far back, forgotten mathematics will reemerge to calculate the trajectory of the rockets that will destroy our temples and create Gethsemane anew. Three, emergence of the soul and the horrors of one, horror of one's own gaze. This old body is carried around like an overcoat, a conscience permanently marred and soiled, the luxury of sanity fleeting as I am perpetually kept under water. If you only knew what this mask conceals. There is condensation collecting on the inside of the paper bag, and the vinyl is all worn out, upon which the cries of the children had been recorded. Shake my soul with ice to be drunk discreetly by businessmen who hope that their wives will never know what goes on in the speakeasy after hours. Four, playback of the damning video at night. The most clever of lies finds its way into the squalor of a culture of reticence, all meaning hidden in ciphers inside of dusty forsaken books upon shelves that creak and crack with time. A cube of graphite has settled upon my desk, improbably filling up the page with its own futility. The emission of truth spirals like a snowball, a deceit is preferable to the horrible verities that will destroy our brains, seizing respiration of the lungs, 
terminating in the heartbeat, just like love does when crushed. At least there is no audience for this suffocation. By some mirabilia, my course remains veiled from casualty to casket. There is an impulse that is impossible to ignore. This device combining the two eyesights has failed, each portal of vision now separated. It is best not to see the most scandalous photographs, better not to hear the screaming of victims, victims of a horrible force that tragically repeats itself in cycles ad infinitum. The details of my misdeeds are secrets lodged in diamonds deep beneath the earth, carbon that had the beautiful misfortune to succumb to the pressure of being. Five, drunk army invading the suburban supermarket. I crumble under the weight of the stone pillars that arraigned themselves and rose atop my soul, crumple like a dandelion under the boot of a sadistic gardener. The key is in the ignition, but the car won't go. In silent dreams there are riots, and in rowdy nightmares there is peace. The elixir is available to all who wish to partake, society awash in horrible freedom. I drink from the cup. Reality sweetly fades away, leading to a new kind of existence, floating in the air as quantum particles that will entangle throughout time and dictate every action which we take falsely for independence. Thank you for listening. That was Christopher P. Gazint, the author of Life's Shishun Halls, for the Siddharata, and now his latest Chimney Sweeps and Prophets. He's a brilliant young man from another century.